So, so we're going to move electromagnetology into kind of a food systems uh, approach here. So this is a paper written by all of us here. Um, Damon's in the room, so he can answer questions as well as me. And this actually just came out, so this is the first time I've published. I've, I'm giving a presentation on a paper that's actually been published instead of four been published. So that's exciting. The papers are in the back there if you want them. Uh, there's three different ones, but one of them is there. And then also I have a sign-up list if people want to sign up. If you'll pass that around, just write down your email and I can send it your way. Um, so what I want to talk about then is our approach to the food systems class that we've developed at Davis. The, just a quick background. As of last year, we have a new sustainable agriculture and food systems at, uh, major on campus at UC Davis. And it was eight years in the making. Uh, we had our first two graduates as of last summer. And uh, the, the, the core curriculum uh, got developed actually over many years. Uh, Damien was instrumental in creating that and using a, a fairly rigorous educational process to try to understand what it is that we should put into those kind of courses. And so I came in in 07 with a lot of that data in hand saying this is what practitioners think, this is what academics think, this is what students in these programs think about what they need, what kind of experiences they want in this kind of education. So it was great for me coming in having all of these reports and papers to say, hey look, a lot of people done the heavy lifting around thinking about curriculum. So Damien and I worked together for a year to build the food systems course and then to implement it and then to assess it and try to understand what we could learn from it. So all this actually occurred in 08, so we, we'll do, be talking about the 08 experience, but I, of course, I've taught it every year since, so I have a lot more things that I've done with it, so we can talk about that if need be. But this is basically an interdisciplinary lower division course for the major, it's introductory, happens in the fall, many of the students are freshmen coming in, this is their first, one of their first classes in college, and also there's some seniors, it's a great mix of students. Um, it complements, uh, a uh, sustainable agriculture class. So that we both, they're both introductory level, no prerequisites. They get taught in the same year usually for most students. And the, the class itself, we built it around social construct, so social constructivist learning theory. I'm not going to go into depth there, but if you want to talk about it, feel free to we'll, we'll talk. Uh, but the one thing we added to the class, which was fairly special, which it was a social science lab component. So basically it means taking students into the field on a very regular basis, going to all parts of the food system in terms of farms, going to food processing facilities, going to distribution centers, going to retailers, going behind the scenes in most of these locations, and then having questions around how those operations work. So getting to actually engage with practitioners and people in the field around those things, which is really fun. Um, and in, in that way, it's student-centered, since the students choose a lot of what they're going to be doing, and it's very inquiry-based, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. But right now, this photo, the students are getting ready to go into the Jelly Belly factory in Fairfield, um, and what they've done is created, they have different lenses, different questions that they've created that they're going to be asking the people that will be interviewed. So they have research questions and then interview questions in order to kind of elicit the data that they want to find out about this operation, how it functions. So they're getting ready to go in and start interviewing the Jelly Belly management um, folks in there. And this is the lab classroom kind of back after they've gone through those experiences. They get back together, they work together as a team to create a presentation about what they found out, what they learned, and they'll present it back to the lab section there. So you can see, often they'll eat <laughs> together uh, because that is a theme of the class. <laughs> this is way too dense, I'm not gonna read any of this, but this is basically kind of the learning goals, what we call them competencies for students to develop for the class. So I spent a lot of 2008 thinking through and also using a lot of reports and other things out there about what, stu what do students need to be able to know, what do they need to be able to do and how do we kind of put those things together. So this is a way of thinking through both the knowing and the doing in terms of skills and knowledge, how we might pair those together and get the class to, to hopefully bring those things out in students. So this was the lens, kind of a, a filter I would call it, through which all the assignments were put. If an assignment could contribute to these different learning goals, then it could stay in kind of the hopper of what we wanted to do. If it didn't do things that I wanted to do in terms of this list, then it got thrown out or got modified in ways to kind of fit these. So that's, that's a different paper, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth here, but I, we do kind of an assessment and a self-evaluation along these learning objectives as well, which is really fun. The design process, again, I can't go into all the depth here, but there was, like I was saying, there was a huge amount of previous work that went into to building this curriculum, and so all of it comes out of that previous work and gets built on and added to. But this is kind of all these various actors involved in design, 
kind of the various products and things that went, we went through. And that's in the paper as well, so I can, you can see more detail there. In terms of the students and kind of an inquiry-based class, what I mean by that is basically the class is designed to be, it's built, students' experiences are built around questions. And those questions are asked by a variety of people. I ask some of those questions, but students themselves and student teams pose many of the questions that they ultimately want to answer, which is really fun. So here I just have a table saying, these are the various things that we ask them to do. These are the, the creators of the question. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's them, sometimes it's them and teams. This is what the object of study is. This is kind of the circles of deliberation. When we talk about social constructivism, they're creating knowledge in partnership with their teammates, with their lab mates, with everyone in class, with me, with their TAs. So there's various kind of circles, concentric circles very often. And then who's responsible for kind of demonstrating the learning that's come out of those inquiries. And that varies too, right? There's still there's individual work that they need to do, but there's also teamwork that they need to do. Uh, and sometimes uh, that varies quite a bit, of course. In terms of what we wanted to understand for this particular paper was, how is it the students experience this kind of class? It was a big question for me, because I had never taken a class, nearly anything like this class. So I was curious <laughs> to know, how does this impact students? to go through this kind of stuff, especially the lab, especially kind of the, the experiential learning components, uh, but also just generally having uh, a great deal of assignments and, and kind of challenging things thrown at them, both in terms of learning, but also in terms of ethics and values, those kind of challenges. Um, so what we did was, at the end of the class, the students wrote a reflective essay, which was to capture the, their learning process from their kind of view. How is it that this class impacted you? Did it change you, did it not change you? Why, those kind of bigger questions. And so, this is a small class this year, it's now almost 60, but there were only 20 students in the, the first year. And so we were able to basically qualitatively code each of those uh, reflective essays. So all of the authors that got involved in this, to have created codes of things we really wanted to know about, like how is it the students are talking about their values? How is it the students are talking about the, the field work experience? But we also were open to kind of emergent themes that came out of those as well. So we created a fairly detailed code list we each read each of the reflective essays, uh, with at least two people read each one, and then we looked at, we pulled out all the uh, quotes and areas that were coded in certain ways, we were able to analyze it that way. And then we also had an end of quarter interview, which was a third party comes in, does an assessment in terms of asking students how they experienced the class, uh, both open-ended and there's some closed-ended questions as well in that. And so that's, none of the instructors, the TAs, myself, were not present at all, so the students can be as, as uh, Right, as they want to be in that without a power differential kind of affecting that. So the interesting part of, of what came out of looking at the reflective essays, I think, was what we call uh, students grappling with the commodity fetish. And the idea of commodity fetishism comes from Marx, and it's the idea that the normal kind of economic transactions that we go through on a daily basis hide a great deal of how society is actually functioning behind it. So it's like we just see a thing, we can buy it, but in reality, there's a huge amount that that is hiding in terms of those social and environmental relationships that support the creation of that commodity. And so in going through the field-based learning experiences and also through readings and through discussions with other students, a lot of students kind of ran into this in terms of seeing kind of lifting of a veil, if you will, on a production system that they didn't necessarily agree with. And that was really kind of intriguing and also a really difficult thing to grapple with. Um, so the... I just kind of basically described that. Uh, but it, this was really, they experienced it, and we, I think we all do, experience it as a tension between what we see, that is what is, uh, and then what ought to be in terms of what our values and our ethical uh, predispositions say that, that should be, what should exist. And so that was very, very obvious in many of the reflective essays, was we, we, we spent a lot of time as a class thinking about and kind of recognizing the importance of values, especially values in inquiry. What is it that is really, really important? What do you want to do in the world? And then kind of taking that into the <coughs> field work experience, getting new information, new evidence, learning about things, especially in relationship to your values, what you hold dear, and really experiencing and kind of reflecting on this tension between how the world's working and how you think the world should be working. So how do we reconcile that is one of the questions that many students were grappling with in their reflective essays in their own experiences. And so most students rectified it in some way you need to do something about it. You just kind of can't let this tension just exist. It has to change you, or you have to change what you do in some way. 
So one of the, the most common ones, and uh, Julie Guffman writes about this quite a bit, is the changes in consumption patterns. So that is, if I just become a good ethical consumer, then that's kind of the, the way to deal with this dilemma and these tensions. Um, other students talked about kind of bringing good food to others, making sure that what they've learned in this class is going to be translated into kind of action on their part to talk to other people, or at least try to make change in that way. And then the another kind of route was promoting and organizing for more structural change, realizing that individual personal decision making, especially as a consumer, is not necessarily going to do much because there's much bigger things at work. So thinking about structurally, how is it the society's function? How is it to change? And how do we, as individuals and collective agents, do action in those kinds of situations? So that was exciting to see. Just to kind of pull out some quotes in relationship to those. So one of the students, as an individual, I can see how I'm the one who influences the food system, and how, as individuals, we can create the change. Another one, this kind of the first route, the second route, of course, I'm still learning myself but I'm helping others learn to be better consumers. How can I get the world to the word out about what I believe in? So both of those are fairly heavily based in consumerism kind of mindset. Um, but then the more structural thinking is, I want to talk, I want to walk lightly, speak loudly, be respectful and accountable to people who do not have the power, resources, or desire to act in the ways that I do. I want to face the toughest challenges and join hands to overcome them. So very different kind of modes of being or thinking about how to resolve that tension. Um, if, if the people keeping time will let me know, and I have like five minutes. Okay. okay, cool. Um, so the other piece that came out was, in, in looking at the reflective essays and encoding them, was this that really kind of repositioning of self in relationship to other things, in part in relationship to yourself, right? You see yourself in a new light, um, but also in relationship to thinking, metacognition, in relationship to learning about deli learning through deliberation in terms of the social setting and not just being kind of autonomous people, but rather learning through the lab experience, which was interesting. Um, so a lot of students explained how the, basically they're unwilling participants in a broken system. They were able to identify some issues between structure and agency, which was exciting. Um, and also this kind of the power of bridging the academic study of food systems together with their everyday lived experience, which is really exciting. Um, students also noted that they were much more interested in kind of the politics behind the food system than they had thought about before. The other piece that we pull out of the paper is uh, metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. So uh, not every student certainly demonstrated metacognition. Many of them weren't able to reflect very well upon their experiences. They kind of turned in descriptive reflective essays. So it's just a few, but still important. But uh, in terms of metacognition, I think it's a really crucial ability for all of us to do in terms of being able to self-assess, to be self-aware of what we're thinking, why we're thinking the way that we're thinking, be able to modify it and notice gaps and also problem, problems within the way that we think. And so a lot of students really did reflect on gaps in their own awareness that existed before the class, saying things like, you know, I, I didn't think about this stuff before. Why didn't I think about it? What, why is that gap there? Um, and some of them, I'll give you some quotes on that. Um, what am I not being told? Is this class has revealed there are a lot of things that we, the public, are not aware of. This one is really interesting. I've realized how unaware of the complexities of food that I was, but why I never learned this before. Uh, why did I never asked? Interesting, reflective question. Um, and so to, to wrap up, then hopefully leave one or two questions in the hopper. Um, there were there's a lot going on here, but there are a lot of really deep meaningful experiences in part because we try to connect it, connect the learning to people's, to students' everyday lived experiences. I think it was a, a powerful thing. And also to take values quite seriously as a starting point of inquiry, which was exciting too. Um, we really did, I think, help facilitate their inquiry processes in a number of different fronts and on a number of different subjects. And that really, I think, did produce a lot of transformative learning for them to be asking the questions, for them to be driving forward on the things that they were really interested in doing. Um, the other exciting thing was this increase in epistemic thinking in terms of thinking, being able to better recognize a worldview, being able to see the gaps in our own awareness, and be able to see how it is that we've come to think the way that we think, to be able to hopefully get beyond that.